This episode of our This Week in XR podcast is sponsored by Zapper. Zapper is one of the world's leading XR companies. Over the past 12 years, they've won numerous awards for memorable campaigns. They've democratized AR by making tools and SDKs that anyone can use. And they created Zapbox, the world's most affordable mixed reality headset. Most recently, Zapper worked with Unilever to create an enhanced QR code called Accessible QR, which enables packaged goods to speak to the blind and partially sighted. If you're thinking XR, give the team at Zapper a call or visit Zapper.com to see how they can help you on your XR journey. Good morning, everybody. I'm Charlie Fink with Ted Chilowitz and Roni Abovitz. Here we are for another edition of This Week in XR. It's August 16th. 2024. Good morning, guys. Morning. Nice to have you back, Roni. We missed you. Hey, guys. Good to be back. Good to be back. Glad you survived the East Coast storms, although I guess there's another one coming in now. So uh... Hurricane Debbie. Yeah. I have quite a, quite an adventure story going up and down the East Coast, uh, driving up to New England and back, trying to evade the storm. Re- really, really funny. You guys will appreciate this. We go west into Virginia, like Western Virginia, to avoid it, and it goes there. <laughs> And then the city we park at suddenly we're, we're you can't go anymore. And I'm watching the weather channel and the weather channel van is like two blocks from our hotel. And here we're <laughs> at the center of hurricane Debbie, please hunker down. I'm like, how did this happen? Did you have a map and a Sharpie and you were drawing things going, it's not <laughs> here. And then it's coming I mean, here. it's this big. A little, and the thing a little just political does... reference, a little political yeah. comment. Reference for those yeah. 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 That. yeah. <laughs> so I, I want to start this week with um, two items that actually aren't even in the roundup Uh, was a continuation a little bit i shouldn't say that uh google is instituting new rules in the (laughs) wake of its in the wake of being found guilty of monopoly practices google will now remove you from its index if you put up that cookie that says you don't want to be crawled by ai um by really? the AI engine. So if you won't contribute to Google's model, they will basically remove you from search that's used by 90% of the people. They make you a second class citizen. Well, this is the beginning of the end, boys. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, if this is not monopolistic behavior, it would be hard to uh, come up with an example that is. Well, well here's a question like, uh, I mean, Charlie, like, it's not, <laughs> here's the thing these companies get so big that we think of them as utilities, but they're not. Right. They are and they're not. Like they are in perception, but they're actually private institutions that can do whatever the hell they want. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but I mean, there has been talk today, or I should say the past week since the uh, guilty verdict uh, about remedies, uh, mm. in, including spinning off YouTube, including spinning off um, the browser business as a separate business. So, I mean, those are pretty extreme remedies, more than I thought they would get. I thought they'd just be forbidden from buying distribution. But that's much more serious. I did some delving into this uh, and reading into it about how it related so much to the Microsoft trial from, what was it, 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, um, and how there was so much reflected in that trial and how Microsoft altered itself in the shadow of that, but actually became a stronger company and actually evolved past it. Well, was you know, the desktop, the desktop lawsuit, for those of you who aren't old, um, AOL and a bunch of other companies sued Microsoft over its monopoly over the desktop because there were no Macs then, really, yeah. to speak of. And uh, the lawsuit went on for several years. By the time it was over, of course, everyone had migrated to search and never looks at their desktop other than to clean up all the documents you've somehow ended up there from time to time. So uh, it was moot. But Microsoft's behavior in the interim affected the long-term future of the business. Steve Jobs had come back, you know, had taken over Apple at its nadir. I mean, this company was weeks away from bankruptcy. Yeah, it was basically gone. And Bill Gates and Microsoft said, holy crap, if if Apple goes out of business, they won't just be talking to us about the desktop. They'll be talking to us about the operating system. Yeah, about the computer industry. Yes. So, <laughs> so they, loaned, uh, they loaned Apple $150 million, mm-hmm. uh, much of which they have kept as equity. So Microsoft is still a huge, huge shareholder in Apple because can you imagine what $150 million invested in 1997 
Yeah. Oh, it's Apple probably got up a thousand X. Today. Oh, a thousand was, X maybe. I was so, there in the front row at that Macworld when they video they video linked Bill Gates in. He wouldn't come in person, and it was like, "What is happening here?" And there was like rumble in the crowd, and it was like it was fascinating, you know, like, "Oh wow, Microsoft is going to bail out Apple." This is kind of a fascinating. Yeah, it was insane. Uh, it was insane. Yeah. Uh, so uh, other things going on this week. Well, first of all, a huge, huge. Well, back to Microsoft before I leave. Okay. There's a lot going on with AI image generation and mm. AI animation of uh, live action images. Uh, so yeah, this has been going on for some time, but Google finally has put out, and I put links in the column today, has finally uh, released its two image generating models. And this is far different than what Gemini was delivering a couple of months ago. Uh, mm. This is something that competes with Midjourney that has editing functions that is quite good and uh, it's integrate. And so, so that's what's going on with Google image generation. As you know, we're all waiting for VO, which is its anime tech to text to animation generator, which should be quite incredible. So but, let me ask you this philosophical question. Do you yeah. think the, the, the slow your roll strategy has now proven itself as the incorrect thesis for company success. Because when Google slowed their role and OpenAI went for it without the ethical concerns that Google had in gen one of all this stuff, Google sort of crashed for a moment and OpenAI had its sort of entree, right? Had its moment. Um, then OpenAI does Sora, but holds it back, right? Just it's lets a very few people it's touch it. Let's very few people touch it and very few people access it. And then there's five other image generators that come and say, well, we're gonna let everybody use it. And the model starts to build. And now here's Google kind of doing the reverso strategy with their image stuff saying, put it out into the world. Don't do the Sora strategy. So it's almost like they're learning from each other. Maybe they're all just using AI to learn from each other, but they're learning from each other in real time and altering their strategy to, to say, you just gotta go for it. It seems like the strategy now. Well, I'm keeping a running list of these AI tools that that they're really it's starting to merge with special uh, special effects tools like Houdini and other um, other applications. So Comfy UI is now a big part of everybody's workflow, uh, and the hits just keep on coming. You know, we don't yeah. have an image generator really capable of doing more than ten seconds. I mean, if you do a few tricks, you can make it a little bit longer, but it really is quite limited today. Um, but it's changing so quickly that even as I speak this, it may not be 100% true. I also wanted to mention, and that's where I started this train of thought, uh, because uh, Grok2 is out now. Grok2 will also do image generation. Grok2 no have very good uh, guardrails. No, not, not at all. So I asked it to draw a picture of uh, Mickey uh, whipping Donald, Trump, uh, Donald Duck. And it took a few tries and they were still smiling while they were doing it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, OpenAI, Dali, oh, and yeah. the other gym rated, did they would give you a timeout for asking yeah, that yeah, question. Yeah, they locked that down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, there is some good in Elon Musk. Welcome uh, to the summer of 2024, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, one more, one more thing. Um, and and this is this is really a goodie because it is about... Uh, Elon indirectly. There is a Starlink competitor. Oh, really? AST. Mm. Apparently, it's worth more than $8 billion uh, because they're launching a Starlink competitor and they're backed by Verizon and AT&T. So obviously the big uh, <laughs> communications companies, you know, Verizon is one of the richest companies in the world and they swim in cash. Their cash flow is insane. Yeah, uh, and so uh, this is pretty serious uh, competition for Starlink, and he's had a semi-monopoly to satellite phones for uh, quite some time. So this is going to be really interesting. So I just wanted to put uh, that on everybody's radar. Oh, and here's the beauty, beauteous thing about it: the satellites are going up via SpaceX. Of course they are. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, like here's here's the ultimate telling side of the future. If you guys all remember the flying toaster screensavers from the early Windows days, well, that's reality now. We have flying toasters moving all around our planet, right? And now this other company is probably going to put up another few thousand flying toasters, and they're all going to be in a line, and they're literally flying around the world. Can, right? can I just give you guys a quick anecdote? So, uh, I think I might have mentioned this like a couple months back. I'm outside in the evening taking my dogs out yeah, you told us about look this up and I think it's UFOs. And if you've never seen a uh, uh, SpaceX, basically satellite train, mm -hmm. it's like a line of colorful dots that's moving really fast. And at first glance, you swear it's a UFO. And then you go to the UFO hotline and it's like, if this is looks like this, this is the SpaceX satellite train. You know, there's a, is, how um, many, there's an app. Need? There's an app for tracking that shows a deep that that shows um where the space station is because the space station is super visible especially if it hits you around dusk because it's getting the reflection of the yeah, sun it reflects back yeah yeah, yeah. so it, it's quite visible at dusk sometimes but it has to be on you and the asynchronous this the orbit uh, uh isn't always the same because the earth is moving Man, the three of us are such nerds talking about flying toasters and space stuff. <laughs> like, what All right, I've got, I've got, a, I've got one to nerd out on: semiconductors. You, you're you're talking about the other Grok, yeah? I'm talking about Grok with a Q. Thank the other you very Grok, much. yeah. So huge, it huge. run by an ex Google guy. They just yeah. landed 640 million. Everybody is looking at the stock price of Nvidia and their you know, 95% market share saying that's not sustainable. We got to get a piece of that. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, and Grok is going to lean very heavily into quantum and they're going to lean very heavily into etching technology, right? Which is the evolution when you literally cannot make silicon any smaller, nanometer smaller by traditional methods, you have to etch it. Um, so it's kind of like etched glass, right? Uh, and that way you can get the transistor sort of situation below sub nanometer sort of you know particle size um this is the future right etching technology and quantum computing is going to change our world more radically than ai will and that's really maybe that's a bold statement but i, I i'm going to hold to that i think that's quite true so uh another topic and uh by the way of course i forgot to uh, mention our guests uh akisha grum of um of uh, genies Genies. Genies, which is a company that makes avatars. Yeah. Uh, so he was, this was your booking, Roni, right? He's a buddy of yours. Yeah, Akash and I are tight. Is there a backstory? Can you tell anything before he shows up? Um. So he is, uh, he's kind of a rock star. His uh, office in LA reminds me of early Magic Leap. There's like a slide and it's just graffiti in the walls, all these like cool kids. Um, he's known in the venture world as like the um, Gen Alpha, Gen Z whisperer. Um, and he basically is obsessed about the idea that you're going to present yourself as an avatar in the future metaverse. Um, and also now and like Instagram and TikTok and all that. And what's, what I think has made genies, uh, initially successful is the amount of celebrities, CAAs, agencies, sports leagues, uh, musicians who are kind of users of, of, of genies. And there's a cash, he can kind of yeah. give you the background. Well, and he's right at scale because it's the right time. Though, this is us. These are avatars of us, right? We're not actually really here. Yeah, we're not real people. Well, and of course, we we could be actually using avatars. They're integrated with Zoom. Yeah. We could use Snap to choose avatars. Charlie's actually an eight-year-old girl in Idaho. Well, my yeah. point is with that a special voice make... synthesizer. Yeah, and she I spends that... she spends her entire week reading tech news and not <laughs> going to school. Yeah, yeah, she's just like <laughs> she's like in fifth grade and you know Idaho Central community or something like that. I guess my point is that cameras. Make avatars of us, right? We are living avatars. This is a yes. representation of who we are. It's Where not is I, I just let a cash in from the green room. So hopefully he's going to show see up his here. Thing there. I, I see his like name. Yeah, I see his name. It's very Akash, low. Can you hear us? Oh, wait. He says, I'm here. here, laugh out loud. I don't know. You know yeah. Hey, there he is, Akash. You guys can hear me, but you can't, you can't see me? Yeah, can't see we can hear you. We can't see you. What's up, bro? But if you have a cartoon avatar, we'd love to see that. <laughs> Hey. Oh my God, uh, Roni! No. Roni was just singing your praises, my friend. Welcome to the show. Ah, good to be here. Thanks so much. What's up, for man? Me. How we doing, bro? Good. Are you in? Uh, you on the ranch? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. 
What is the awesome. ranch? What is the ranch? No, we have a we have a big meeting here today, and I was talking to Ronan yesterday about it. So um, last minute, I had to come. You probably to can't you. talk about where he is, though. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, oh, I'm in Idaho. Idaho. <laughs> Idaho. Oh, it's probably Sun Valley. Okay. He's there's, somewhere. He's somewhere. Akash, there's something Sun about Valley. your headphones that's kind of clipping. Um, no. So Maybe I would just try using your 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 Mac or your, whatever you're on to just use the okay. audio. Stay okay. There. Charlie, you want to give, or Ted, do you want to do the classic uh, intro? The classic intro of, of, of asking. Like, yeah, who's the Kosh? Why is before, he here? Before, so what happens yeah. usually <laughs> with these interviews, especially when one of us knows the person well, is we already, we go to like step four of the process and we go deep dive. And all I know I, I, I jumped on and you guys were on like step nine of our roadmap. And I was like, <laughs> am, I, am I even needed? No worries. And, and exactly. then and our millions of listeners are like, who's Akash? What's going on? So, right. so Ted usually rolls it all back. I do. I usually back up a step and go, hold on, let's back up a step and well, start from the beginning. Well, first of all, Akash, how old are you? You look like you're 22. He's 12, <laughs> man. <laughs> That's so nice. No, I'm 32, actually. I'm pretty, I'm pretty old. But uh um, well, let me just say for my kid. from my perspective, you're younger than my kids. So that makes you a kid. Yeah, you're <laughs> half our age. You're half our yeah, age. I always think every single year I go back for Thanksgiving and my parents and my 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 relatives obviously have zero idea what I do. Um, but every single time I go back, they're just like, Are you getting a little too old to be building products for Gen Z and Gen Alpha? I was like, <laughs> <laughs> maybe but probably not like i guess like the way that we i think you're it. on the outer band of gen z maybe sure before you guys keep going start yeah. from ground zero tell us who you are what you do why you exist and what's going on with genies <laughs> why i exist uh so i mean, I mean uh my name is akash ceo of genies uh, genies is an avatar technology company where we're creating developer tools to empower people to be able to create their avatar experiences in the new internet. And we define the new internet as the intersection of three main trends of the buzziest trends ever, but we, you know, we have conviction in them, AI, XR, and then also gaming. Um, so, you know, more specifically, we feel like an avatar is going to be the next method of communication, uh, specifically as it pertains to Gen Alpha and Gen Z. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you got a lot of press and awareness because Bob Iger dropped into your world, right? And was excited uh, about what you were doing. And Yeah, I think, I think, I think that was part of it. I think, um, well, I think, I think there's a lot of awareness about genies because, uh, originally when we started catching fire was in 2019, 2020, um, and celebrities ended up being our first adopters and we had no intention of that. Right. So like, I mean, like we were a few kids in San Francisco, we didn't even know what CA was. I remember like I had to call my buddy at LMU and ask him what that CA was. was. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. So, but, but like all these celebrities started adopting our product because they wanted to leverage their avatar um, on their social media channels. And so we just had base, we had thousands and thousands of like tier one celebrities that were consistently just using their avatar. Um, and so that's how we gained our initial awareness. And then, you know, Mary Meeker joined our board. She led our round and then Bob, I joined our board. And then like, we just, we've just done a bunch of product announcements and, and releases, I think within the space. So, but yeah, Bob, Bob, obviously, yeah, that was, that was a splash for sure. Yeah. And, and you were, um, uh, you were sort of born and grown in the world of the pandemic. Yeah. I mean, like you, you kind of blossomed while everybody was sort of stuck at home and, and spending a lot for of time. Sure. For sure. I think anything that's a digital solution, of course, blossomed during the pandemic, right? Because people were forced to spend more time in the, uh, on the internet and so forth. Um, and I don't think that's going to be too different than what the future is going to look like though. Right. Like I, I always have this like kind of like this, like classic, like dumbed down way to look at things. It's like, we're not going to get less digitally immersed over time, right? Like we're not going to go back to horses and carriages. Like we're only going to get more and more consumed by the internet and whatever the devices are in front of us, which I know is probably part of this podcast. And so um, in my mind, like part of the pandemic was actually just a look into the future. So it's a little bit of like, hey, this is kind of how we're going to generally operate. Doesn't mean that we're going to be restricted physically. And I think like the physical component plays a huge role in the way that you take advantage of your digital self. But um I do, I do, I do believe that uh, we are going to be spending hours and hours of time on the internet, like we were during the pandemic, for sure. But yes, I mean, like that was, I think, a good. Um, that was, like, that was another leg of exposure for us. And are you? I'll, I'll ask one more question. I'll let the other guys dive in. Are you working now? How much can you share about strategic partnerships and things to make? Like we're all sitting on a Zoom, um, Zoom chat, right, to to do this recording um, yeah. on, on like super ease of use ease of entry. So if I wanted an avatar version of myself or Charlie, um, 
one click and there it is and it's great and it does exactly what it's supposed to do are you working with zoom or google meet or apple on facetime or any of those folks yeah so i mean like roni obviously has an inside lane because i talk to him twice a week i can't talk about so he, but i can't i can't talk there's a lot of uh there, there's significant partnerships we've been working on for a year that we're going to be announcing before the end of this year, which we're really excited about. Great. Um, biggest ones till day is not, is not, not even close. Um, so we're excited about that. However, what I will say about the FaceTime stuff is I actually feel like um, that is doing a disservice for the avatar is just thinking of it in the context of a filter or something like, like for example, on FaceTime and, and, and more. Um, you know, we believe that. Um, so first of all, like if I'm FaceTiming you, I kind of want to see you like I want to see Ted like I don't really like I, like I don't really care to see like a cartoon version of you is, is it like a fun novel thing is it like like funny here and there like sure like did Apple do it with Memoji sure did people do it for a little bit yeah but that was more of a mask it wasn't like the power of an avatar being a method of communication and so like there's two main aspects in the way that we think about it it's like one um there's the visual appearance of it so being anything that you want to be but then two it's really the data that you accrue inside of the avatar that captures who you are on the internet based on what you say, based on what you do, how you interact. And then that uh, repository of data can then be used for personalized experiences across the entire landscape. Now, what you have to invest in there is a lot of UGC, a lot of interoperable frameworks, which we've done over the past four years or so. But in, in our opinion, um, an avatar is going to realize its fullest potential. Actually, and the reason why I was excited about this podcast is when we're in the next computing device. And we believe that that is gonna be inevitable at one point. Um, is there a, there's a, almost like a spectrum of avatar use cases. There's, I mean, it can be used in so many different ways. On one hand, which is like the most futile hand, uh, but it's kind of how avatars got popularized in the first place are like sticker packs. You know, I can render like 50 versions of myself and now I'm a sticker pack and I can text it to Ted or I can text it uh, to Charlie and Roni and so forth and we can laugh about it in like DMs, whatever. The furthest extent of that is it actually replaces my physical self and is my complete unilateral representation, how I move, how I speak, how I talk, how I interact with people. And that is going to have to happen in the new axis. And so, you know, in our mind, we think it's inevitable that an avatar, you know, an avatar is a prerequisite for those three trends that we just mentioned. I mean, you have an AI persona, gaming, and then also XR. So we feel like the question is at what time? Will people adopt it? Yeah, Charlie, sorry. So so what, <clears throat> what you're talking about is probably the biggest competition in tech right now. And it's spread across all the big companies from Amazon to, to Google. Everybody wants to be your agent. Part of sure. what's driving the hysteria around Amazon stock the past six months is not the Vision Pro, which I think most investors dismiss as uh, Tim Cook's folly, may or may not be true, but that's the way it's viewed. And no one cares about that. That's a little tiny thing compared to integrating AI into the thing you're using all day long, which is not your computer. It's this goddamn thing, which yeah. is always in my hand. So it knows me better than I know myself. It knows where I go. It knows what I read. It knows who I am, but it doesn't right now. It's dumb. It's just a tool, but it could. And one of the things that people have been talking about, I, I'm going to say for 25 years, I, I could be wrong, is life logging. And you find it in a lot of early books about the internet, mm. right? We have the capability to record our lives and harvest that data. To say nothing of the fact that when I have an argument with my wife and we're like, wow, that escalated quickly. We could actually play it back and see what the hell we're doing with each other for the past 40 years. Mm. Um, so, and, and then that extends, right? So it knows me that well, it can probably do a lot of shit that I'm not interested in. Right. And it, but then the best part, and this is the part I'm, I think is a movie since you're hanging out with, with movie people, maybe you can go make this movie because it's so related to what you're doing. But the natural end state, if I do that for 30 years, 40 years, is that there is a digital twin of me that will outlast, you know, will outlive me, potentially sure. live indefinitely. So I had an idea for a movie, right? Where, of course, most people, if I went to see my great grandfather you know he would be a russian guy speaking yiddish wearing a yarmulke in harlem of all places which was the jewish neighborhood in new york before all yeah. the jews moved to brooklyn 
So I wouldn't be that interested in talking to that ignorant, moralizing, religious <laughs> nut who kept having kids because that's the only thing there was to do. And so um, I imagine that that's the way Akash or or Roni we would appeal we we would appear to our grandchildren. Right? That guy talks so funny. Why is he wearing a shirt with writing on it? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so and and but what if that? Uh, so here's the movie. Right? Of course, the kid goes back to write a book report or something and starts having a relationship with the AI that has been miserable that it, that becomes miserable when it realizes it's been doing nothing for 30 40 50 years so it wants the kid to help somehow free it so it can have perpetual not intermittent consciousness what what do you think well I, i'd watch that movie i'd for sure <laughs> watch that movie it sounds like a really interesting one um Look, like I think, I think of course, like uh, a lot of people fast forward to the dystopian view of what happens. I, I don't think that. By the way, the thing that I just shared with you, I think, is the opposite of dystopian. Yeah, utopian. Like it's like it's 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 it's, it's a cool, utopian. Yes, it's it's a very cool, interesting thing, and I think it like what I like about you know sometimes when I'm just getting extremely uh, philosophical about the foundational principles of our world, I sometimes sit there and I'm like, okay, like you know, you could argue that the the best game loop on this entire earth has been the currency that drives how people are, you know, currency being money, how people are supposed to contribute back to this like crowdsourced project of a world or uh, when, um, you know, the fact that like, you, you, you know, uh, uh, women can only get pregnant up to a certain age and you have to, like, th th that, that's it's like in its own right another game loop. But I feel like things like this start to break those game loops, right? Like all of a sudden it's like shit, like, for example, if you're saying like, you know, we're able to at one point recreate AI personas in a way that I don't actually don't have to think about a spouse. Like here's like one, like I, what you mentioned breaks out to the second game loop of earth. Um, I don't actually have to think of a spouse unless it's about exclusively companionship, but I don't have to think of it as so much as creating a child. What if I could just create one myself, right? And in many ways, like, you know, on one hand, there's um, an AI agent being able to accrue all this information and being by my side throughout my life so that it can carry my own legacy after I pass, which is what you're saying. But another one is, okay, like I can hand select, I can hand create what these personas will be. Now that to me is actually gonna cause more harm <laughs> and there's gonna be more cons with that than good, more than likely, unless it's controlled and it's constrained. Um, but look, like, I mean, like that's why I feel like the scale of what's happening right now is not even yet realized because it does have the power to break foundational core game loops of society and earth that we've known for thousands and thousands of years in a way that social media, the internet do not like those do not break our game loops, but this all of a sudden does. So it's, it's interesting. You, you use that term game loops a few times and I'm going to, I'm going to ask you something that I, I would love to hear your take on Akash Moni's take on it too. Um, yesterday I was with someone who's pretty deep in the world of AI and they were talking about the, misconceptions of how people have been represented historically hmm. um, when the actuality of the people that in these very important historical times and, and eras looked a certain way because rich white people painted other rich white people. And the hmm. only representation hmm. you got of the Revolutionary hmm. War and the people that were in that war were hmm. people that looked like Ben Franklin, George Washington, Thomas Paine, et cetera, et cetera. When actually the people that were in the Revolutionary War looked much like us and many, many different types of people, different skin color, different looks. So they're using AI to actually generate truth now where there's mm -hmm. a falsehood that's been created over hundreds of years of what people actually looked like in various historical times. And we can actually use AI and avatar sort of mentality and philosophy to say, this is what the world really looked like. Similar to like when you watch old Charlie Chaplin movies at 18 frames a second and you have a sense of, oh, well, that's what movies looked like back then. But in the turn of the century, when people looked at those movies, they weren't playing at that frame rate. They were playing sure. at normal frame rate and they looked high resolution and photorealistic, albeit not color yet. Um, so it's, it was an interesting thing I learned yesterday and I was curious if you guys had some, some thoughts on it. I wanted to expand on that a little bit. 
Yeah, I think I think um look, I, I think this is where Google misstepped in the very beginning, right? Like using AI to generate truth. I feel like there's there there needs to be at one point um all of this stems from something core. And so whatever that core thing is, uh needs to somehow hold like, people accountable for truth. Because like the the concept of truth this, these days is one of the most convoluted, most difficult things to be able to define. And it's ob obviously subjective, right? And so like there's like some things that I think can be deemed as fact. And all of a sudden those conspiracy theories are gone or they're things that are depicted as accurate. So to your point, it's like reliving an actual moment. And instead of, I mean, like truth in many regards in my mind is just putting the facts in front of the person for them to be able to come up with their own truth. So instead of great, like, let me read a history book. And there's like facts in there, but then there's a bunch of paintings to your point that are maybe in there that are construing like a certain bias. If we can somehow leverage everything that's going on today to actually put the person, right? Like imagine if you are in your Vision Pro V8 and you're sitting there and you can relive and you can actually situate yourself into one of those moments in the Revolutionary War. And then using the facts and being like a bystander and just standing there, you then come up with your own interpretation conclusion. That to me is actually getting back to the truth, right? Um, so I'm with you. I mean, like it's it's a very interesting time. Um, but yeah, you almost need like your equivalent of like the constitution of like AI and like where like the internet is going in order for someone like to I think be able to derive the truth from that. So <clears throat> a lot of what's tied up with what you're describing, Akash, particularly as it relates to gaming, has to do with a topic we used to uh, delve into quite a bit: the metaverse. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I mean, Akash is like all in on that man so I, yeah so i was know, gonna you know, i was gonna take the conversation there since you're sort of gaming in your head what the future looks like um let's talk a little bit about the metaverse and and also other wearables can, can yeah, i add one, one thing to that sure. uh charlie so um i know too much that i can't talk about what akash is doing so i won't say that much but um the three of us know neil stevenson right he's the found you know Rose well, not the way you do but yeah but what's interesting is I think of Akash as a child of the metaverse, right? Like like the, the kind of person who gets it more deeply than what Mark is trying to do, like is actually, and has a cool utopian, fun, awesome view of it. Not this like weird on the spectrum view of what it's supposed to be, but like this kind of the party you want to be at. Uh, so anyway, I, I think it's cool for, because the metaverse as cast by Neil Stevenson was a cautionary tale. The the vision of that world that Akash is building, why why kind of like pal out with them and why why we're bros, um, is really is really interesting and fun and interest and cool. So I, Akash, you should maybe talk about that a little bit because I think yeah. not enough people understand where that where that can go, what it could be. So I think like um, you know, the first thing I'll say is you, know, you guys were talking about like hey, like you guys got like your initial awareness and your big splash when. Uh, Bob joined the board and then when like Mary joined the board and so forth right and if you go back to a lot of that press period it was peak quote-unquote metaverse hype and if you look at a lot of the headlines and a lot of our leading quotes from that um, I would lead with met the metaverse is my least favorite word out there and the reason why is because you could see that everybody was thinking about the world or the future internet so myopically and drawing a direct correlation between that world or that word and meta horizon, right? And so you're sitting there being like, this is bound to not end well for the entire space when all we're doing is trying to advance the internet to its next medium, right? So there's a lot of quote unquote metaverse things that are very popular that are philosophically um, an inevitable reality at one point and there's general consensus around it, but you just avoid saying the word and then people just don't have the heebie-jeebies about it. So um you know, Fortnite or Roblox or things of that nature, right? Like those are things where is some of the most, arguably the most popular places that Gen Alpha hangs out is arguably the most um, authentic Gen Alpha feels when um, they're able to hang out with their friends. And like Gen Alpha right now specifically does not hang out on Instagram. They do not hang out on social media. They go to social media to consume content, consume announcements. I go there to like, you know, even I go there, I'm like, all right, like what's going on with the presidential race, what's going on with my friends, it's all highlight moments, who's at dinner with each other, who's going to Coachella, whatever. But do I like, am I there online with them to hang out? No. 
Where are people on light to hang out and play with each other? Roblox, Fortnite, these gaming open open platforms. As soon as you say the word metaverse, everyone's like, whoa, what the fuck are you talking about? But it's, if you just talk about it in the context of um, what their behavior is, then it just seems very natural. So I guess we're all in on the philosophy of the internet. We're going to get more consumed by the internet. We're not going to go back to horses and carriages, like I said earlier, right? And if that's the case, then we want to be able to empower people to create those experiences in the in the further consumption um, of the internet itself. Um, and so, I mean, I think, Charlie, you asked a question off the word metaverse. What was it again? No, I was, uh, I was, uh, you, <laughs> you asked some the question. question. I mean, the, the, you know, question I, I was asking was, you know, what is your view of the metaverse and, and where is it going? And I thought that, I mean, yes, Roblox and Fortnite are the metaverse as we understand it today. Now, other people would say, no, they're not connected together, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, that's really, in my view, oh. uh, picking, you know, uh, picking, choosing and picking among the definition. You know, you're being an absolutist when you say, you know, Matthew Ball, you have to fulfill these eight conditions. Yeah. Well, I think if you fulfill four of them, you're pretty much on your way. So, well, for I, example, well, there's no uh, creative economy really to speak of uh, on Fortnite. There is to a certain extent on Roblox if you're a game creator, but really it's not a creator of economy on the scale or of the sophistication of the one you see in Second Life. But the fact that it exists in Second Life and that it is so popular among a million people, which is a pretty good damn sample, uh, it suggests that that's what's going to happen to Roblox and Fortnite uh, as a natural byproduct of people kind of living in those worlds. Well, I mean, I, the, let's look at the Disney Epic deal, right? Disney investing $1.5 billion into Epic to create this interoperable, gam gamified, AI, UGC-driven platform. And I just said five buzzwords right there, but again, they all play a role. But, right? but yeah, I mean, look, Disney, Disney has spent the last 25 years sitting on its hands in video games, thinking that they're going to license uh, the rights to those games the way they license Mickey Mouse for t kids t-shirts. Uh, and it obviously is not like that at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, it's so, interesting. So they've, so, so they finally, after 25 years, they finally said, oh my God, we're not licensors. That is us. You know, and how do we now reinvent ourselves you know, as a company that exists both with a foot inside the physical world, but also a foot in this emerging world. And they finally just did the thing they should have done 25 years ago, which yeah. is, um, it, which is hire or partnership a company with a company that does it all the time. You don't pass a magic wand over Burbank and become a video game company. I think sure. it's interesting, and, you know, because we're all in like violent agreement about what you just professed around the metaverse, hyper-violent agreement, right? And none of this is new, which is really important to, to sort of understand, is that there have been versions of a tech layer on reality for many generations now, right? Like in our age, Charlie and Roni and I were all in AOL, AOL chat rooms. And that's a version of now what we use this terminology, the metaverse. And before that, there was CompuServe. And after that, there was Yahoo Chat. And then there was Minecraft. And then there was Call of Duty and um, Grand Theft Auto. And you lived inside those worlds just the same way we lived in an AOL chat. Yes, the graphics were different, but the metaphor is the same, right? And then over the past couple of years, there was this story-like sort of thing where the metaverse is going to take over everything, which isn't true because it's already taken over everything. <laughs> It's just in a different formation, right? And things are constantly reforming. So what I think you're doing with avatars is just reforming what we are all already doing. Like it, this is yeah. not, nothing's really new here. Right? Well, well, what I found really interesting is like Akash has gone, and th this, this is what I really enjoyed about what, what he uh, got me kind of in his, in his Kool-Aid for genies is that he's gotten very philosophical and deep about what avatars could be, what they represent psychologically, philosophically, socially, uh, much deeper than anyone I've ever met. I've probably met everyone uh, in the space. And I think like things like that, where someone goes beyond like a book or a comic or the superficial idea and actually makes it emotionally valid. And I think, Akash, you were talking about sort of going back to first principles, things that are like really fundamentally true. So it's not just pixels, but there's like meaning behind what's going on. 
Um, and it was interesting because I saw this show like um, it was on HBO about people who live in VR all the time. Like I think it was like we live. We in met VR. in VR by Joe. We met in VR. He's been and, our and guest. And it's kind of interesting. And like, you were there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and the and the way they interact and how they can become their true selves and like very few people actually really understand that. And it's like there's there's a commercial aspect, but there's also like a spiritual aspect of why they do that. I feel like. Akash kind of goes really deep on that. And I think you act to win in this space, you have to go much deeper than like a fad. That's why I thought it was like, you got to really think deeply about this thing. And, and, uh, you know, I, I'd never met anyone who's gone that deep and philosophical other than someone like Neil or some of these other writers, like that's actually running a company and kind of gets it, which I found really cool. Uh, there's Akash, I, I just wanted to complete the thought you mentioned. We were not letting wearables, you talk, by the way. talking about wearables <laughs> and good. VR. Uh, yeah. and AI. How, how do you see that manifesting itself over the next five or 10 years? Wearables, VR, and AI. Or X, call it, call it mixed reality. Yeah. I don't want to limit um, it to VR. So, so look, it brings up like a topic around UGC. Um, and UGC, I think is, a, a, you know, part of what all brands, IP companies and products will have to do is build a relationship with Gen Alpha or Gen Z. And the way to build a relationship with them comes down to a few different factors. One of the factors is um, Gen Alpha actually doesn't want to just consume whatever you put in front of them. They want to create with you. They want to be able to pave the path forward for your brand, right? So like they don't want to be just exclusively a buyer of uh, your music or your um, or your IP. They say, hey, let me remix that. Let me DIY that. Let me like do a duet on TikTok with that, right? Like they want to be able to make it their own because they feel like they can put a spin on it that's additive to uh, additive to the community. And so, um, look, like I feel like uh, when you're talking about like wearables and I think in AI um, and, and living in a brand new medium, um, wherever people exist predominantly and wherever they want to hang out with friends predominantly, they'll want to be able to accessorize their identity in a way that makes them feel unique, good, um, and, and, and whatever they're trying to get across. Right. And so, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're building internally or we have built internally is around the concept that you're bringing up, which is like, how can I generate a wearable or fashion? Fashion is going through such a critical moment, I think, in the physical world. But like, how can I go through, how can I generate fashion in a way that makes me feel good or express something that words, video and text um, or, 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 or words, photo and um, text uh, uh, can't just justify, right? Um, and so I actually think like fashion within the digital ecosystem is going to be one of the most uh, lucrative and one of the most exciting places to play for sure. And we yeah. see that of course within gaming, right? Like over 50% of the revenue that Epic and Roblox generate on a quarterly basis is literally through avatar customization. Right, I was just going to say that this is a well-proven thesis. This is not a new thesis that skins and weaponry and things to enhance your being in this virtual world, in this technology layer is already a real la large economy. Yeah, uh, generating that, $5 billion dollars a year. So yeah. I would say on that's that, big. On that note, you guys should keep talking. I have to go actually do a meeting about this in the real world. So I'm going to say goodbye right now and let you keep going. And uh, we've, Akash, we've got great, we've, great discussion. Thanks, Ted. Okay, we'll talk to you. See you next week. Uh, we've got about yeah. five minutes left, Akash. Oh. So I want to make sure uh, that you have said everything you want uh, our listeners to hear. You've got about uh, 10,000 nerds download this show, but they're the right kind of nerds. So, so I want to make sure <laughs> that you that you've said what you wanted to say on the show, and how can people work with you, and can can I come to the site and build an avatar? Or what yeah, what totally. are we what are we doing today? Yeah, so I mean, like an avatar technology company, I think that's like the core center of like who we are. However, you know, we really empower you to create any type of avatar experience. At the end of the day, an avatar experience. It's just a game as we know it today, but in the future, we feel like every single use case, every single mobile app that we have on our phone is just going to feel like another Roblox, right? Um, and so if you want to build your own Roblox um, in many regards, you can come to us and you can build it in a very interesting and unique way. Um, starting with, again, like our interoperable frameworks, which cater to immense UGC capabilities. Um, and then you can also work with some of the greatest um, and amazing IP out there, right? So we have like an entire roster of talents. Um, historically, you know, we signed deals with UMG and WMG in the leagues as well, um, where we work with thousands and thousands of individual talent so that you can generate experiences leveraging their avatars or fashion, as you, as you were just mentioning. Or you can also generate like your own use cases as well. So, yeah, I mean, like, look, thanks so much for having me on the show. If you guys, um, 
anybody out there is listening, definitely come to our website, uh, get access to the dev kit and start building. Fantastic. So right now, when you say access to the dev kit, you're looking for fairly sophisticated uh, users and people who who know their way around a computer and can build things. For sure. For sure. Right. At least you're, for the looking, time you're but... looking for those user users who generate user generated content. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, like, look, like I think there's uh, some some tools there that are more appealing to less technical people. Right. So especially on the fashion front, you don't have to be that technical to be able to create something and drop a line um, within any of our platforms. Um, but if you're generating experience, at least for right now, yes, you have to have some sophistication. But, but but the guys, let's frame it. If you're like a high school junior or senior, kind of a you know good techie kid, you could build something in a Unity app, build a game in a couple of days. You oh, yeah, you can build download the Genius Kit, do something right for sure. A hundred percent. Yeah, usually I do you have a, a step by step kind of YouTube learning hierarchy the way the game. Yeah, we have a do, we so. have a yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a, a dev community, um, a dev community uh discord that you can go into and then you can get access to all those learnings as well. Yeah, so so it sounds like my students might be able to a hundred percent, a hundred percent. That's great. That's that great. would be a really cool thing, Charlie, actually to see you you know it'd be great to have your students do something. And report back what it's like to build and play with the genie avatars. That would be really interesting. Where can they use the genie avatar that they create? Can they use it uh, yeah, in so, the platforms that we're talking about, or does it have to be in a different place? So, social media is like where everybody uses it today. So Instagram, TikTok, and Snapchat. But a lot of the deals that we're closing that I was just talking about at the uh, beginning of this call, um, there's going to be new places for people to be able to create much more immersive and interesting experiences too in a 3D form. So um, we're excited to announce that before the end of the year. But anybody that gets early access to what we're doing um, will also come into the fold and they're going to get pretty strong hints about where they can be building and where they're going to be able to publish. That is awesome. That is well, awesome. guys, I actually also have to run too. But guys, thanks so much <laughs> for um, having me on. And, and Rody, I'll probably talk to you in... I don't know. An Later hour. today. It's all good. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. Thanks again, guys. Akash. Have a great weekend, everybody. And uh, yeah. Roni, hopefully we'll see you next Friday. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks. Bye, guys.